So over the past few weeks, we've been looking at this prophecy in the Old Testament. Your Bible is unique. Most religious writings are written in the span of one person's lifetime. The Bible was written over a span of 1,500 to 1,600 years by over 40 authors that lived on three different continents. And the thing that brings all the ancient manuscripts of the Bible together is the person of, of Jesus. You have the Old Testament and the New Testament. And in the Old Testament, that's B.C., before Christ, humanly speaking, you have all of these writings. There's at least 300 distinct prophecies about the coming Christ or the coming Messiah. You get to the end of the Old Testament. It ends with the book of Malachi. There's a 400-year gap there where God was silent. And then you have the book of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament. And you have the gospel writings, which write about the life of of Jesus, but at least 300 distinct prophecies prior to the birth of, of Jesus about the coming Messiah. Now, here's the amazing thing. Most of those prophecies, no one would have control over, humanly speaking. Where the Messiah would be born, how he would die, those kinds of things. And so in the book of Isaiah, 700 to 750 years before the birth of Jesus, you, you have this prophecy. And we sang about it just a moment ago that the coming Messiah, his name shall be called, do you guys remember what it was? Wonderful Counselor, can you say him with me? Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Today I want to talk to you about the Prince of, of Peace. And the word peace there is Hebrew, and the idea is shalom. Have you ever heard that term before? Shalom. Shalom means completeness. Shalom means wholeness. How many of you, you you've seen uh, the Star Trek shows, the TV shows Star Trek, or the movies, or, or any of that? Okay, does anybody remember Dr. Spock? Dr. Spock had a greeting. It was a greeting, and, and it was also the, the way he would, he would send you off, and, and there was a little hand signal that he would do. Can anybody remember that? Any location? Can you give me the hand signal right now? A few of you nerds, good job. The hand signal was, was this. And what would Dr. Spock say? He would say what? Live long and prosper. Now, when we talk about peace, we don't do this. What do we do? We do this, right? That's also the symbol for, for victory in World War II. Does that sound familiar? So peace, victory. But Dr. Spock would say what? Live long and, and prosper. Well, Dr. Spock was played by an actor named Leonard Nimoy. He was Jewish. And when he was a kid, his parents were Orthodox Jews. And they would go to these worship services. And in one particular worship service, uh, he was to cover his head, not to peek as, as part of the worship. And the rabbis were standing up front. There was a group of, of them, and they were speaking a blessing over the people. Now, Leonard was not supposed to peek, but he broke the rules because they started to chant. I've seen them do this in Israel. They started to chant, and it was kind of a freaking him out a little bit. He hadn't experienced it before. And so his head is covered in the midst of the service, and he's like, I'm going to see what's going on. And so he peeked underneath, you know, the thing that was covering his head, and he sees these guys uh, up in front of all the people in front of the congregation, and they're speaking in Hebrew, doing their hands like, like this. And he heard these words, may the Lord bless you and keep you, and may he make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May he lift his countenance upon you, and may he give you his peace. Does that sound familiar? That's a blessing from the book of Numbers in the Old Testament. But when he looked up, he saw them doing this symbol and he was familiar with the blessing. It's the blessing of shalom. Shalom literally means this. May you be full of well-being. May health and prosperity be upon you. May you have total wellness. And little did all the Trekkies know that every time Dr. Spock said, live long and prosper, it was the blessing of Shalom. And what's interesting is he said he, he would go to these different Star Trek conventions, you know, where all the nerds would dress up and stuff, and they would, they would wave at him like this. And he said they didn't know it, but they were waving blessing at, at me. When the Bible says that the Messiah, the Christ, the coming Christ child, that he'll be called the Prince of Peace, it's saying he'll be called the Prince of Shalom. The Prince of Blessing that he'll usher in complete peace, com complete wholeness. Now, we're going to read the passage here in just a second. But as we read the passage, I want you to notice some words. You're going to see the word government. 
The idea here is that the government is broken. This is a biblical concept. <laughs> but one day the Prince of Peace will make it whole. Shalom. And that government will become what it was originally intended to be. The idea in this passage of scripture is, is that, that the world is broken. Can we all agree on this, that the world is broken? Uh, we prayed about it a, a moment ago. Uh, the weather is, is broken. There are tornadoes and hurricanes and, and, and those kinds of things. The weather is, is, is broken. Uh, people are broken. Uh, government's broken. The system's broken. If I'm really honest with you, I'm I'm broken. I mean, the, the New Year's about to happen. I, I do New Year's resolutions, but the truth is I cannot live up to my own standard, much less God's. I'm, I'm, I'm broken. But the Bible says 700 to 750 years before the birth of Christ that there would be a prince of peace, a prince of shalom, live long and prosper, that he would make all things new. In fact, he would redeem all things into what they were originally intended to be. And this is not just individuals, this is the world itself. This is every rock, every tree, every animal, full redemption, full complete wholeness. The Prince of Peace, the Prince of Shalom will bring full completion to God's creation and will rescue it from its, from its brokenness. Pick up with me here in this passage of scripture as Isaiah writes it, Isaiah chapter nine, beginning in verse to, it says, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And we'll talk about this week in our Christmas Eve services, this, this great light. Light is a theme throughout the scriptures. And we'll celebrate Christmas talking about the light that is in Jesus. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Now let me ask you a question. Do you ever feel like you live in a land of deep darkness? A light has dawned. And then look at these words, verse three. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest. So within the context of this prophecy, something is being planted throughout the ages that will eventually bear great fruit. That's the idea of harvest there. As warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. Here's the idea, ultimately, ultimately good will conquer evil and there'll be a day of celebration where we celebrate the reality that all evil is gone forever. And then you get to verse six. In the context of the prophecy, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, which is fascinating because when you read the Gospels, Jesus never gets political. And yet, on the cross, above his head, it says what? Does anybody know? It says, King of the Jews. The idea is it's a future kingdom. I'll talk about that here in just a moment. The government will be on his shoulders and he will be called, here it is, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father. Say these next three words with me out loud, all locations. He'll be called what? Prince of peace, the prince of shalom. He'll bring completeness, wholeness to everything. Verse seven, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne. To his peace, there will be no end. Did you catch that? He's gonna establish a government where there'll be no end to peace. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And then it says, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Zeal is a word for passion. The idea is God is bringing this plan to fruition because he's passionate about his creation. He's passionate about people. He's passionate about you. And so he put this plan together in place because right now things are broken. In our humanity and in our sinful nature, we have broken things, but God's established a plan and he will bring complete wholeness. He will bring it all back together. There will be complete redemption. There will one day be the full expression of of shalom. In the context of this plan, I talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we talked about mighty God. Jesus comes on the scene. This, this child is born. And when he arrives, he doesn't come in this massive, powerful way, riding a chariot in the sky, you know, made of fire. He's born in this messy barn 
It's the Christmas story to Joseph and, and Mary. And, and why doesn't he come as a warrior? Because ultimately the plan is to wipe out evil without wiping out you and me. Because you and I are born with a sin nature. The Bible says in, in our hearts we're, we're inclined toward toward evil, and God wants to wipe out evil without wiping out you and me. So Jesus paid the penalty for your sin and mine. He died on the cross, and he rose again and ascended to heaven, but he will return again. And the first time he comes as a baby, but the next time he comes, he comes as a warrior. And he'll be riding a white horse, it says in Revelation, whose name is Faithful and True, and he will wipe out all evil for all time, and he will establish a government. It will not be a democracy or a constitutional republic. It will be a monarchy where he's king. It will be a benevolent dictatorship, and it will be, it will be good. And here's the thing. Right now, you and I are in the middle of the plan where peace is offered to you and, and me that we can experience the future kingdom and the wholeness of what will be right now in the here and now. That you and I can receive Jesus into our lives and begin to experience his leadership right now in this broken world and he begins to make us whole from the inside out. So there's this current reality of newness in Jesus and there's this ultimate hope that we have that everything will be made new. So here's what I want to talk to you about today. What does it mean for you and I at this part of the plan to follow the Prince of Peace? What does it mean to, to represent him? What does it mean to be people of the blessing, people of the peace, people of shalom in the world that we live in? In fact, right now, all locations, if you would, and if you're watching at home, you can do this with me. Just turn to somebody in the room or next to you in the service and give them the signal and just tell them, live long and prosper. One, two, three, go. I want to talk to you about how to be a person of that blessing, how to represent the Prince of Shalom. I'm going to give you four things today you can follow along with me in your notes. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. It's the same idea. These are the words of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. He says, blessed are the peacemakers. The word blessed, the idea there is this idea of wholeness. It's the same thing. That there's a satisfaction in the soul that begins to happen for those who are peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. So let's put the whole plan together. So now you have the arrival of Jesus 700 years later, 750 years later after this prophecy. And the Christ, the Messiah, has been born. And he's teaching. And he's saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's talking about the future kingdom and the reality of the kingdom that he is bringing to the world. And he's saying you can experience this in the here and now even in the midst of a broken time. And he's saying one of the ways you do this, one of the ways that your soul will experience blessing is to be a peacemaker, to be a shalom maker, to, to be a person of blessing to where everywhere you go, people just experience this reality, live long and prosper, right? How do we be people of peace? I'm gonna give you four things today. Follow along with me on the Sun Valley app or you can write these down if you want. Four things about peacemakers. The first one, peacemakers are full of peace. Peacemakers are full of peace. Does it, does it not make sense to you that a follower of the Prince of Peace would be experiencing peace? Doesn't that just kind of go together? And yet we do not live in peaceful times. The world is broken. The Prince of Peace said, in this world you will have trouble. Now he's coming back, he will make all things new. Uh, but in the meantime, we live in, in, in the midst of brokenness. But you and I can experience shalom even in the midst of it. Peacemakers are, are full of peace. I've never met a troublemaker that's at peace. Have you? And yet, when we look around sometimes in our society, and maybe it's media, and maybe we're just getting a bad rap, but it seems like there's a lot of people that think that we're supposed to be jerks for Jesus. Be a jerk for Jesus. I'll just let you know there is no such thing. Why? Because we're known as children of God by the way we make what? That's hard to do. I'm getting there. 
There we go. By the way, we make peace. By the way, we represent the Prince of Shalom. By the way that we bring, we bring blessing. Let me talk to you about how to have peace because the truth is a lot of us are followers of Jesus. But, but sometimes we get off, off track. And right now, if you're like, I'm not at peace, and it could be circumstantial, and, and I get it. It could be there's a health issue. It could be there's a family issue. It could be there's a financial issue. It could be that you are experiencing the reality of the broken world right now in a very real way in, 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 your, in your life. But let me, let me tell you how to experience peace, even in the midst of the brokenness. Peace and hope are kissing cousins. If we're going to experience the hope of the Prince of Peace, then we fix our hope on him. And as we fix our hope on him, peace begins to show up in our, in our lives, which would beg this question. What's your hope in at the moment? What's, what's my hope in? How is it that Jesus can say, in this world, you will have trouble, but fear not, I've overcome the world. How can he say stuff like, but don't, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe, believe also in, in, in me. My, my peace, I, I leave you. How can he say that knowing that there's going to be trouble for you and me? See, everybody on the planet, whether you believe in God or not, everybody is a person of faith because we've all fixed our hope on something or in something. Everybody is a person of hope. You have to be. You, you can live quite a while without food. You can live a few days without water. You, you, you can live, you know, a couple of few minutes w without, without air. But you can't live a second without hope. The human soul thrives on it. We, we need it. The question is, what is our hope in? Because what your hope is in, it's going to determine how much peace you have. So if your hope is in, for example, if your hope is in money, because we, we tend to put our hope there, that everything rises and falls on the, on the market. And here's, here's the challenge of this, right? So if, if the market is doing well, you're anxious because you know sooner or later what's gonna happen. It's not gonna do well. Can I get a witness, right? And if it's not doing well, you have a hard time with peace. Why? Because it's not doing well. I, I knew it. You ever wonder why, and we'll go, we'll go way back in time, like when the stock market crashed, you, you know, at the beginning of the 20th century and, and, and that whole thing happened and, and there were lots of suicides. You, you know why that, that is? Because somebody's idol died. All hope was lost because all hope was placed in the wrong thing. And, and I say that and I'm looking back in history, but the truth is I do, I do the same thing. You do the same thing. We put our hope in all kinds of things. Some of us, we put our hope in a human relationship. And, and, and you want this relationship to bring you shalom. You complete me. <laughs> Literally, you know what that means? You shalom me. Tell that to your date later. Right? <laughs> you shalom me. <laughs> no human being will ever complete you. I love you guys, that's reality. My wife will never complete me. I married a sinner and she married an even bigger one. <laughs> and so we're partners and, and, and we're best friends and, and, and we're lovers and we, we, we struggle in that, you know, in, in, in life and we, and we fight for one another and, and, and we work for, for oneness, but I will not find my complete shalom there. And if you're looking for that in, in a relationship, some of us, you're not looking for it in your spouse or whoever you're dating. You're looking for it in your kids. And you're expecting your kid to somehow bring completeness and wholeness to your life. And when you had that little kid, they were cute and cuddly. And when you held that little baby in your arms, you were holding a little sinner. <laughs> and they're not going to complete you. But we do this, don't we? We put our hope in all these places because all of us are looking for shalom. All of us are looking for redemption. And where you have your hope will determine your, your peace. 
And so in my life and in your life, I would encourage you, you want to constantly be adjusting your trust because we're all putting our faith in, in something. But there is a God who loves us. There is a God who wrapped himself up in flesh so that he could give his life for ours, who died on the cross for you and me. This is called love. And then three days later, he rose again. And he's in the middle of this plan, hoping that as many as possible will come to repentance because ultimately he will wipe out all evil for all time. And he wants to wipe out evil without wiping out you and me. So he's wanting full repentance, as many as possible, as many as possible. But one day he'll go, okay, I've had enough. And the rider will come on the horse named Faithful and True. And he'll establish his government. And he'll reign forevermore. But peacemakers are full of peace. If you I can't get peaceful, which you can't give what you don't have, right? So we adjust our trust and we remember where our true hope Lies. Second thing here in your notes. Peacemaker, offer people, this is a play on words, a piece of encouragement. Peacemakers, offer people a piece of encouragement. If you're taking notes, write this down. Words are powerful. Words are, pow are powerful. You can be a person of blessing and you can bless people, live long and prosper, or you can curse people. Everybody look at me here for a second. If Sun Valley is your church, if you're a guest with us, I'm so glad that you're here today. I'm gonna just have a pastor moment for the people of Sun Valley. If you are a person of Sun Valley, this is your home church, this is where you worship Jesus, then I wanna encourage you as your pastor to be a person of blessing. Online, on social media, in the room, wherever you go, don't be a troublemaker, be blessed. Be a, be a peacemaker. Follow the Prince of Peace and bring shalom to the world. Be a person of blessing. I'll give you three things you can do this week. And in fact, just, just make this your, your homework. Uh, encourage three people every day this week going into Christmas. It ought to be easy because it's Christmas time, but I've learned it's harder at Christmas time. Anybody else learn this? The other night I was at uh, Zupa's. You ever been to Zupa's? Free commercial for Zupa's right now. I like their soup and salad. And I had a long day. I had one of those 12-hour days. I was really busy and, and kind of getting some things finished. And uh, I call my wife, you know, we're doing the dinner exchange. And she's like, I'm going to call in the order. Would you run by Zupa's and pick it up? And I'm like, great. And so uh, I'm on my way. And I get to Zupa's. And, and you park in this little spot, you know, and they're supposed to bring it out to you. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I love that, by the way. And so I'm sitting there for a while and nobody's coming to the car and, you know, I checked in and all that, nothing's happening. And I thought, well, I'll just go in. So I go in and nobody's in line, but there's like eight people gathered around the cash register. And they were all people like me who were supposed to be picking up their orders, but that wasn't happening. And so I'm kind of making my way and I'm, I'm seeing the scene and there's this high school girl there. And she's laughing <laughs> like this. And it's just really making everybody mad. Because these people have been waiting, you know, like for 20 minutes for their order. And it was supposed to be convenient. I mean, the world owes you your Zupa salad and soup. And it owes you to you in your car so you don't have to get out. <laughs> and so they're in the store and they're not getting what the world owes them, Right. And this girl's just falling apart, but she's not handling it well. She's like nervously laughing, and it's just making everybody more mad. And this young man comes up, and, and, and he looked really young. And as I get older, people look younger all the time. But I'm, and I'm going, I don't know if you're old enough to work here. But he starts, he starts laughing. And so this guy next to me is, is about to lose his business, which is the nice way to say it, right? He, he's about to lose it. And he steps forward and he starts talking to this, this young woman. And so, I mean, I was kind of mad too. I'm ready to go home. But in this moment, because I was prepping the sermon, I thought, <laughs> it helps sometimes. I thought peacemaker. And so the one mistake I did make is I did my hand like this to that guy. And he kind of gave me one of these. I said, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you right now. I leaned forward. And I just told the young woman, I said, you know what? I know you're laughing because you're nervous, but you laughing right now is not helping things. <laughs> I said, probably what you want to do is go get your manager and tell him and her to come save the day because you got a mess up here. And I go, that would be the 
good thing to do. And she like, did like this, right? So the manager came out and we, and we got down to business and 20 minutes later I left with my soup and salad. <laughs> Little bitty thing, if I wasn't prepping the sermon, I probably would have got that wrong. <laughs> but here's my challenge for all of us. Can we be people of peace? Can we offer people a piece of encouragement? I'm gonna challenge you to encourage three people every day this week. Uh, who can you write a note to? Who can you say thank you to? Who can you uh, compliment in an appropriate, God-honoring way? Who can you encourage? Live long and prosper. Shalom. We have an opportunity this Christmas to be a source of encouragement for some people that really need some hope. And uh, I have a new friend. His name is Ocho. He's a new friend to Sun Valley. And I want to invite you to watch his story. I grew up in San Bernardino, California. Grew up without a father. Did have a loving mother, but she worked three jobs to support me and my sister because she was too proud to be on welfare. Grew up with a lot of anger, a lot of anger issues over the fact that my father was never around. So I looked at gangs as, um, as my way of acceptance because they make you feel loved. They make you feel like you're part of something, part of a family. So I was part of the Southside Crips. They started me out drug dealing in the corners, uh, beat up people for money. I was a person that if I knocked on your door, it was bad for you because I was coming to collect for the drug man and I was gonna find out where your children went to school, where your family lived, because if you didn't pay your debt, I was gonna hurt someone you loved and eventually caught up with me. First night in prison, um, I was a little, I'm not gonna lie, I was a little scared. I knew that I couldn't show that. I knew that I had to be tough on the outside and people had to see this hard image of me and I knew that I had to prove that I was big bad. Basically, I proved it because whatever I was ordered to do, I did. There was no help for me inside prison. There was nowhere where I could go and, and, and speak to someone. So in my mindset, it was all about survival to where I did some really awful and horrible stuff in prison. In the real world, stuff that I would not be forgiven for. It's basically kill or be killed in there. It's savage in there. You're constantly in fear that someone's gonna take you out, that another gang is gonna, is gonna kill you. Your family's threatened in there. If you don't do what they say, you think you have friends, there's no friends because you're always watching your back, so it's lonely in there. It's a very lonely place. It's a very scary place. I've seen people go in there and never come back out. I heard a word I never heard before, and that is a word of love, a word of second chances. A God who died on the cross, not just for you, you, and you, he died on the cross for everybody. He shed his blood for everybody. That includes the prisoner, the homeless guy, the forgotten. And trust me, I was forgotten. I was the nobody, and he died for me. When I think about God's grace, I think about when he was dying on the cross, he was in between two prisoners. And one prisoner looked at him and said, remember me when you get to heaven. That right there told me that God doesn't forget anybody. And if we just say, God, forgive me, God, come into my life, God, remember me, God will forgive anybody. I only wish that when I was in prison, we had some kind of program where they talked about that love, where they encouraged you that, you know what? Even though you've done what you've done, you can be saved. You can be God's child. He loves us all. And God behind bars and churches such as Sun Valley who are willing to go inside those prisons and preach the word, that's what God wants. And he wants everyone to feel his love because not one person is unforgivable. 
Not one person is beyond redemption. He changed me, the darkest of dark. I've done every single drug you can think of, and not one compares to the love I feel from Jesus Christ. I wish every single prisoner, every single person that grew up in the life I grew up could feel this because then they would know that you know what? That life, that way of living is nothing compared to God's love. Best feeling in the world. So right now, uh, Sun Valley is in six locations, and then obviously we have uh, all of our church family uh, who worships with us online as, as well. Our seventh physical location will be in a prison here in our area. We are partnering with God Behind Bars. We're receiving a special offering to launch that new campus. Um, it looks like this past week, as we're working through things, we may be able to do that at the end of the first quarter this next year. So we're receiving an offering to do that, challenging every family in the church to take the $100. That's a stretch for you, do what you can. If that's really easy for you, then do more than that. Uh, just pray about what God would have you do. You can give that offering at prison.sv.cc as we prepare for our prison campus, but there will come a day in the near future where we're celebrating baptisms, and we'll do that at our six current locations plus our location uh, in, in a local prison. And so that's just right around the corner. But we want to be people of peace. We want to represent the shalom of God. Things that are broken, God wants to make new again. Number three here in your notes, we want to offer people a piece of value. A piece of value. Uh, every person that you've ever laid eyes on is somebody that Jesus died for. And reality is we can't give someone dignity. They already have it because there's somebody that was created in the, in the image of God. Um, I, I wanna give some leadership to something here for, for, for just a moment because I've heard this uh, over the past couple of weeks. And if you haven't been here and you wanna know more about the prison campus, if you'll go online the past couple of weekends uh, in the sermons, there's, there's videos about uh, what, what we're getting ready to do and you'll kind of be able to put together the, the, whole, the whole story. But I've heard people say things like, um, all sin's basically the same. All sin's the same. Um, I don't, won't make you raise your hand, but have you ever heard that before? And, and the idea in, in somebody saying that, I, I, I think, is that in, in God's eyes, that, that sin is the same. And, and I'll just say, uh, when, when it comes to the other side, all sin is the same. We've all broken God's law. We're, we're, all, we're all sinners, but I need to just give some leadership to something here real quick. Uh, we're all sinners, but some sinners need to go to jail because it's, it's, it's what's best for society. And, and I've had some people ask me some, some different things. The, the, the hard part about this ministry is we're gonna see the reality of, of the grace of God. And for some of us, the grace of God is gonna bother us because some people who've done some horrible things are going to receive forgiveness and they're gonna be radically changed and the reality of the grace of God is gonna kind of hit us of how big that grace actually is. And it's a beautiful and, and, and a wonderful thing, but for some of us, we're, we're gonna struggle with it. And so I, I just wanna say this as, as, as your pastor, we're all sinners, but some sinners need to go to jail. That's real. Um, I wanna thank all of our police officers We've got a lot of them here in our church, and I want to thank you for the way that you protect and serve. Your, your and I'm going to call it this because this is what it is, your ministry is valuable. And so, guys, we, we, we are, are smarter than the simplicity of it's either this or this. The world is complicated. And so we're gonna love and support local police in, in their job and help them as best we can. We do a lot of things for police that I'll talk about more in, in, in the future in serving police officers. But we also wanna help people on the other side that, that are behind brick walls and laser wire meet the reality of God's grace. Does this make sense? It's not either or, friends. It's always both and. 
The Bible says that Jesus is full of grace and, and truth. And, and we're always living in that tension. Well, which is it, grace or truth? Yes. Well, let's resolve it. Well, if we do that, we just messed up the gospel. Because this is the gospel we're piling in. We're all more sinful than we can possibly imagine. And we're all more loved than we ever dared hope. Everybody's valuable. But some people need to pay some consequences. And, and, and I'm grateful for those who protect us. And all this is going on at the same time. Does this make sense? And I just believe through this ministry, we're going to see lots of prisoners come to faith. We're going to see families come to faith. We're going to see uh, officers and guards come to faith. And I think in the years to come, we're going to see some amazing things. Because we're going to be people of peace. Shalom. And we're going to usher in the blessing of Jesus as we follow him. Last one, we wanna offer people the Prince of Peace. We wanna offer people the Prince of Peace. And this is how the world changes, not politically, but personally. God's plan is he changes the world one life at a, a time. And so here's what I wanna challenge you with. Uh, it's the week of Christmas. Get your shopping done, we're getting close. That means Christmas Eve services are this next week. Just about anybody will come to church on Christmas Eve. I was, I was sitting, I'm gonna turn 50 next year, so now's the time to renew my life insurance. Is everybody with me? When you turn 50, it goes up a lot, right? So I'm meeting with my insurance guy, and his name's Chris, and he lives over in Queen Creek, and we got to talking about his life and his kids and all that, and uh, I just said, dude, you know, why don't you come check out the church? And so he's gonna be at our Queen Creek campus at one of our Christmas Eve services. I'm super excited to see what God does in the life of, of, of Chris and his, and his family. And here's what I did. I just texted him an invitation. So I had a quick conversation and then he left. I said, I'm gonna text you an invitation. Here's what I would encourage you to do. Invite somebody this week to a Christmas Eve service. I'm gonna equip you right now. You can text the word invite. Everybody take out your phone. Just text the word invite to 48,000. Here's what's gonna happen. We're gonna send you back a link. And then you just send that to somebody as an invitation. And here's what I know. God does amazing things through those invitations. Everybody look at me. Right now you're like, eh, don't, don't be somebody's no. Be somebody's yes. Be somebody's shalom. I'm never afraid to invite somebody to a life of peace. To an eternity of peace. I'm never afraid to invite somebody to the reality of shalom to live long and prosper. Because that's the ministry of our Savior and as followers of His, that's our ministry as well. So you just put the word invite in the message. The number you're dialing is 48,000. We'll send you back the link and then you can copy that and send it to anybody you want. But seize the moment this week. And I'll make you this promise in our Christmas Eve services. Whoever you invite, they're gonna enjoy it. They're gonna laugh, they're gonna hear about the love of God, they're gonna be given an opportunity to receive his love in their life. Be a person of blessing. So everybody look at me here for a second. I wanna speak a blessing over you and then pray for you as we enter this week of Christmas together. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And may he make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May he lift his countenance upon you. And may he give you his peace. In the name of Jesus. Will you pray with me? Right now, as names come to your mind and heart of somebody that you can invite, would you just lift that name up to the Lord? I've got several. I'm going to pray with you right now in my heart and mind. Father, we lift these names up to you. We thank you that one day everything will be made whole. And even right now in the middle of your plan, that's an act of your grace. We don't see it. We don't feel it. Sometimes we're mad at it. We're mad at your grace because we want you to just wipe out all evil right now. But you want to see as many as you can come to repentance. And so we join you in that cause. And so I pray we would be peacemakers. And I pray that we would represent you well. We lift these names up to you and we ask that you would bring peace forevermore to each and every one. And Father, this Christmas, may we celebrate the hope that we have 
in Jesus. Hope has a name, and it's you, Jesus. We ask these things in your name. Amen.